the uh, in First Corinthians chapter ten verse thirteen, Saint Paul does say, "God is faithful, and He will not let you be tempted beyond your strength." But with the temptation will also provide a way of escape that you may be able to endure it. So 1 Corinthians 10, 13 would be a, a good passage to go to. God gives us what we need. And that our scripture scholar, Father Nathaniel, tells me that the Greek word is paraspos, which can be temptation in the proper sense or trial in a more general sense. So God will help us. He sometimes seems to leave us with uh, nothing and we feel like we're hanging out on a limb, but as Father Tom described very beautifully, he has a way of uh, infilling just what we need, and often what we need is a little bit of strength and presence and love. Sometimes we want answers and God wants to give us love. So we're going to talk about that here more in just a moment. But if I can ask for your prayer for for me for a moment, and I'll also be praying for you. Let's just place ourselves in the Lord's presence. <laughs> and let's ask for our ladies and sisters. want to do a little, uh, little exercise for a moment. Just ask you uh, again, in a moment of silence, just to think about it, the way that we talked about already, what's happening inside of you right now? Let's just take a little bit of stock of that. You can even, if you have a journal or you're taking notes or something, you can even write some of those things down. What are some of the thoughts, the feelings, what's, what's happening in you in this time of the afternoon? Share all that with the person next to you. Probably makes you feel a little uncomfortable. It's even more poignant if you actually wrote some things down. To think of reading that or just passing that to the person next to you, unless that person happens to be your spouse. Although that can go both ways, right? And just do that to give you a chance to close your eyes here and allow some of that sleep to settle in but also to just give you a little bit of the experience of the vulnerability that comes with interiority. In order to really share what's going on inside of us, it takes a lot of vulnerability. Because the stuff that's going on inside of us, and especially the more tender that is, the deeper it is, the more easily we can be hurt. If that stuff is rejected, I really feel like I am being rejected. And if that stuff is dismissed, I feel like I am being dismissed. It's much more tied up with our identity. So it's very difficult to share that and to become vulnerable. But vulnerability 
is so powerful. And in one way, we can say that what God has revealed in Jesus Christ is that divinity does not mean uh, invulnerability. In fact, divinity means infinite vulnerability. Nobody is more vulnerable than Jesus, especially Jesus on the cross. That's what God looks like. And if we are going to become more God-like, then we have to learn to become more transparent, as Father Tom described it. We have to learn to become more vulnerable, at least be able to open our hearts in appropriate settings to become meaningfully vulnerable, as Jesus was willing to do on the cross, able to reveal everything to us as he poured out his whole heart and revealed the very interior of God. Divinity, being godlike, means infinite vulnerability. And so we can see that in, in Jesus' ministry, and I just listed a few passages from the Gospel that describe the kind of healing that comes just through being vulnerable. And it's one of the beautiful things in spiritual direction. Sometimes there's a little bit of wisdom. Maybe some of you who have had a chance, these times are very short, and of course, you know, many things that are not optimal. But even in 15 or 20 minutes, there are ways that we can open some areas of our hearts. And even if the person listening to you hardly said anything or added any particular wisdom, you feel better. Something happens. Sometimes even some healing takes place. And we really see that in the scriptures. A lot of times the miracles of Jesus, well, every time really, the miracle of Jesus requires faith. It requires somebody being vulnerable, trusting to some degree. And then Jesus meets that with divine power and there's some experience of healing. In some cases, it's just becoming vulnerable and the person is healed. An example is the man with the withered hand. We can imagine that that hand, all bent up and withered, is a cause of great shame for him. People ask, you know, is this because of his sin, the sin of his parents, what's wrong with him, he's cursed by God, all of these kinds of things around that withered hand. And I, I imagine him kind of hiding that away as much as he can, just sort of keeping it a little bit hidden because it's so shameful to him. Jesus has this little debate with the Pharisees in the synagogue about whether it's okay to heal this man with the withered hand which probably made him wither even more, that his attention was being drawn to his withered hand. But finally, Jesus says to him, stretch out your hand, which is probably the last thing he wanted to do. But the scripture says, as he stretched it out, it was healed. Jesus didn't even do anything more. He didn't say anything, he didn't touch it, he didn't spit on it, he didn't, nothing else. He, as he stretched it out, it was healed. And a lot of times it's what happens with us. Just as we stretch out that kind of withered hand, whatever that is in our own woundedness, what others have done to us, the ways that we've suffered, the things we've done to ourselves and our sins, just as stretching it out, the very process of sharing it brings grace and healing to it. Another example of that is the ten lepers who cried out to Jesus. They initiated that step. The man with the withered hand didn't even cry out to him. Jesus took his own initiative. But the ten lepers cried out to Jesus and asked him to heal them. And he said, go show yourselves to the priests. And it says, as they went, they were healed. So they had to stand in the faith that Jesus had sent them and take the risk of believing. There's a vulnerability that's there, and as they went, then this healing comes to them. Another example is Jesus has a way of drawing out vulnerability, and this leans into the second part of this talk, which has to do with the way that we listen, listening in a way that helps people to be vulnerable, that helps people to share. side of the road. Again, that beggar is crying out to him, Jesus, son of David, have pity on me. And the, uh, the, the apostolic customs agents, uh, 
Jesus' apostles try to hit him. Just quiet yourself. The master's busy. We're protecting him from uh, and, and Jesus says, bring him to me. And he brings the blind Bartimaeus over. And then instead of just saying, well, obviously you have the seeing problem, you know, so uh, let me just touch you and fix that all up and then send you on your way. Jesus wants to draw him into relationship. Jesus wants to draw out deeper vulnerability. And so he asks him the question, what do you want? See, that's a question of interiority. What do you want? What's in your heart? What's your desire? And I can imagine that man hesitating. He probably lived his whole life with this blindness. He probably realized it, 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 for the first time, perhaps, he could be set free from this. Is it even possible? Should he even dare to hope? Could he even say it? I can imagine a great deal of trust, vulnerability, is opened up and asking him the question and then in the response of that blind beggar who says, Lord, I want to see, but to really say that from the heart. It's a beautiful way for us to enter into prayer as well. Allow Jesus to come to us and ask us that simple question, what do you want? Do we have the courage to really speak that from our hearts? And maybe with the same answer, Lord, I want to see. Can we admit our own blindness? Can we admit the blindness of our pride, the blindness of our self-righteousness or indignation? Can we admit the blindness that prevents us from seeing the Lord and just say to Him, Lord, I want to see. I want the humility that helps me to see you as you are, that helps me to see you in my brothers and sisters. It's a lot of vulnerability, trust, faith, to open that up to the Lord. Vulnerability also has a way of moving towards totality. When we get to the deepest thing, we have a way of just sort of sharing everything. A lot of times when we share the deepest secret, we feel that a person knows us completely. And an example of how that took place is the, the woman at the well. Jesus engaged her in this conversation and asking her some questions, and she gives some responses, and he's kind of testing her desire, and she's speaking what she knows, and it's a little bit of interaction, and then he gets to the point that he actually reveals her deepest secret. You have five husbands, and the one you, you're with now is not your husband. And she apparently feels exposed and loved. Not exposed and condemned, but exposed and loved at the same time. She experiences the mercy of God. And what's her response to this? She runs into the town and she says, Come and meet a man who told me everything I ever did. No, he didn't. He didn't tell her everything she ever did. We just watched the conversation happen right there. But he got to the deepest thing. And by getting to the deepest thing, they have a sense of, that somebody really knows me. And they know that deepest secret. And it's the, the most treasured thing that a spiritual director will hear. I never said this to anyone. And then that deepest thing emerges. Such a precious treasure. And that's the kind of trustworthiness that we want to have. That's the kind of attentive listening that we want to foster is to make an environment in which someone can actually share with us something they've never shared with anybody else. That's something beautiful, something worth striving for, working towards, to be listeners, to be those who can receive the secrets of others, hold them safe, and give them, in return, the love of God. This is really so much at the heart of our spiritual direction. And then just a last example, I love this passage from, first of all, Luke 2.35, he talks about Mary's heart being pierced, that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. And we see a ministry of compassion in that. When we allow the sufferings of others, when we allow the struggles and pain of others to actually pierce our hearts, so that we enter into their darkness, so that we enter into their night, 
enter into their suffering with them, if we allow our hearts to be touched, to be pierced by their sorrow, it has a way of opening up the hearts to the healing power of God. And so that's that kind of listening, which is there's nothing robotic, there's nothing mechanical, it's not just a skill, it really is a way of opening the heart to receive the other, to make a safe place for the other to share what is most intimate and most deep in their hearts. And so we talk about a vulnerability also of the listener. When we listen in a vulnerable way, when we listen in a way that makes us able to be affected by what we're hearing, that kind of listening has a way of opening the hearts of others, like Our Lady. She's the great example of one who listened, who really took her, the experiences, the testimonies, the witness of others. She was really able to take those things and receive them into her heart. She had that compassion to enter into our darkness and to accompany us. So she is maybe in one sense the, the great example, model for, for spiritual directors as well, a model of compassionate listening. And then related to her, there's another uh, little word from Jesus on the cross. He tells the Apostle John, Behold your mother. And it says, From that day on, John took her into his own self. Eis ta idia in Greek. Idia is related to the word identity. He really takes her so deeply into himself. We get about six different translations. I wonder what it is in Arabic. Uh, we get about six different translations into the English from that passage to try and express into his own home, into his own things, into his own idia, into his own self, into a very deep place in him. And that's the kind of listening that we can do, that we take people into our hearts, that we bring them into us, and so we can hold them also in our hearts. There's a lot of healing that happens, and a lot of direction. And the Lord becomes very present just through that very experience. So I'll just read you a little passage along these lines. Jesus enters into our wounds. A couple of scriptural passages there from the prophet Isaiah. And then St. Peter also quotes that passage. By his wounds we are healed. Because he takes our wounds on himself. By his wounds we are healed. All vulnerability leads to participation in a unique way in the cross of Jesus. As the spiritual director enters more fully and vulnerably into the role of Jesus, he shares more personally and intimately in the crucified love of Jesus, who weeps with those who weep and rejoices with those who rejoice. The spiritual director will also discover sentiments of love filling his own heart and the mercy of God being expressed through him. The sentiments of God as expressed in the prophets, my heart recoils within me, my compassion grows warm and tender, become the sentiments of the spiritual director as well. So this kind of vulnerable, attentive listening is a mark of a good spiritual director and something that really hope, helps to open the hearts of others, bring them bring us both to the cross of Christ and receive the healing power of His grace flowing from His pierced heart. I included a couple of references. I wasn't sure what setting we were going to be talking in. and uh, There are a couple of videos that I like to show, but if, if you just uh, Google those top lines that, that are on your sheet there, Empathy by Brene Brown, you'll find a little two and a half minute video. And then also, uh, well, I'll just talk about that for a moment. She just describes very beautifully the kind of vulnerable, she calls it empathetic, listening, which can be so healing. And the temptations that we can have are when somebody shares something with us that's very vulnerable or they're hurting in some way, we can, have a, we can find ourselves a little bit self-protective and unwilling to enter into that. I don't want to share in this suffering. I feel uncomfortable that somebody is becoming vulnerable, and we can start to put up some little defenses, like she says, empathetic listening seldom starts with the word at least. My marriage is falling apart. Well, at least you have a marriage. My son is failing out of school. Well, at least your daughter is doing well. And we can have a way of avoiding the pain Avoiding the situation by, by trying to say, oh, you know, don't, don't feel bad. It's 
another way of saying, don't cry, don't feel bad, don't... But just letting someone enter into that place and being with them is so healing. It helps to open hearts to the, to the grace of Jesus. Sometimes we worry about finding the right words. I don't know what to say. That's a perfect thing to say. I don't know what to say, but I just want you to know I'm here with you right now. It must be so hard. Just simple things like that can let someone experience and feel very painful things and know that we are with them. We're not waiting at a distance. We're not putting our hands out in front of them. We're with them in the pain. And when we are with them, we know that Jesus is also with them. So that even when we are not with them, they're able to let Jesus into the pain in a new way, in a deeper way. There's also a beautiful video, the next one there, if you, if you go to YouTube and put in, it's not about the nail, you'll find a very funny but very poignant video there as well. A woman who has, uh, is, is complaining about all of the pain and her headache and the, uh, you know, all of her sweaters are snagged and, and this thing, and then it pans out and you see there's a nail coming right out of her head. And her boyfriend or husband, whoever he is, he says, well, I think the problem is that you have a nail. And she says, it's not about the nail. Will you stop trying to fix my problems? <laughs> it's obviously very funny. It's very enjoyable. But it also points out, and, and the video describes as he eventually gets to the point of saying, that must be so hard. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, and then her heart just opens even more. And sometimes we can think, especially men, I think we're inclined this way, like, just, just pull the nail out already. But sometimes, psychologically, people are not ready to have the nail pulled out. They're not even ready to recognize that there is a nail. And it's not until they're really sure that you're there to stop the blood flow and to make sure that their brains don't fall out with the nail or a number of these things, it's not until they're sure that they have your full support and commitment that they're really able to address what's going on in, in themselves. And so being present to someone, sticking with them, and supporting them goes such a long way towards the healing that, that the Lord wants to bring into our lives. Having said all this, we have to acknowledge this is no walk in the park. It takes a lot of attention. It takes a lot of effort. Sometimes we think, oh, you're just listening. Sometimes we even think, well, what good did you do? You didn't say anything. You didn't tell them anything. You didn't give them any answers. Just listening in this way, really entering into the suffering of others, really opening your heart to be affected by what other people are going through, takes a tremendous amount of energy to hold your attention. It's so easy to let our minds wander and start thinking about the rest of our day and think about what we had for lunch and think about what's going to happen next week. It's so easy to let our minds wander, but to actually hold your attention and give your full attention to someone takes a lot of energy. Pope Francis describes in uh, his message for the World Day of Communication, this was during the year of mercy, 2016. The whole message is very beautiful on listening and mercy. And so if you want to whole teaching from Pope Francis on this. I really recommend it. But I just uh, quoted a, a, a sentence or two there. He says, Listening is never easy. Many times it is easier to play deaf. Listening means paying attention, wanting to understand, to value, to respect, and to ponder what the other person says. It involves a sort of martyrdom or self-sacrifice as we try to imitate Moses before the burning bush. We have to remove our sandals when standing on the holy ground of our encounter with the one who speaks to me. Going back to that video by Renee Brown for a moment, she points out that empathy requires us to connect with something in ourselves that helps us to understand what someone else is going through. That's the kind of listening that we have, which takes, as Pope Francis said, a lot of attention, 
respect. We have to decide that what someone is going through, it's so easy to dismiss maybe some problems and say, well, that person is just messed up, or their life is messed up, or I don't have time for their problems, or so many easy ways to just dismiss people. It's easier to play deaf, as Pope Francis said, but to really be present, to connect with something in our own life, in our own heart that helps us to understand somebody, to really want to understand them, and to get inside of what they're experiencing, it takes a lot of attention, a lot of compassion, a lot of love. It requires from us a lot of love, a self-sacrificing love, like the love of Christ. We have to learn to see people as that holy ground. You know, there is no one who has ever lived, there is no one who will ever live, who will be exactly like you. The uniqueness that each person has reveals to us something about God that we couldn't get from anyone else. And to really reverence that, to feel the privilege of being ones who get to hear someone's internal experience to receive someone's God-given uniqueness is a tremendous privilege. Like Moses, we should remove our sandals in reverence before that holy ground. I found it, thinking about listening, talking about this, looking for, for guidance from different places, uh, uh, two different uh, ways that Things that I'd like to share with you that are on the, on the back of that page, page two of our vulnerability and listening handout. And there are things that are worth pondering a little bit more. I'll just sort of open them up for you a little bit, and then I'll let Father Tom do a little bit of talking. The first one is from the teaching of uh, Dr. Conrad Barr. He, is a, he was a psychologist trained in the first half of the 20th century and was, was finding... Uh, some, some deficiencies there in the psychological training that made him want to just set it aside until he discovered a, a psychological model from another psychologist that incorporated the anthropology of St. Thomas Aquinas from the, from the Summa Theologica, kind of fuller human uh, anthropology, psychology. So discovered a lot of insights in his work there. And it's a lot of beautiful writings. He has a book uh, of essays specifically for priests and religious, called I Will Give Them a New Heart. A lot of beautiful teaching in there. In any event, he uh, described this process of listening called affirmative listening or affirmation, very much along the same lines of what I've been talking about, really drawing close to people and standing firm with them in a way that helps to firm them up. And to, remove, to return to that image of the nail for a moment, that nail in the forehead, and sometimes it's, you know, it's manifested in different ways, this kind of struggle or problem or uh, this, this thing that is bothering us so much. And it might even be obvious to us what it is, but the person is not really ready, doesn't have the strength to kind of pull that out. If we pulled it out, like everything else would fall apart at the same time. Sometimes we need our defenses to hold us together. Sometimes when we've been hurt very badly, the only way that we can sort of get through is to distract ourselves and have some denial. And, you know, we need, we may need our defenses to hold us together. We have to be very careful before we start going in and dismantling people's defenses. We can cause the whole operation to fall apart. So, affirmation is a way of entering close to people committing, being present, developing trust in a way that helps them to sort of strengthen in themselves, strengthen in their identity, and, and then perhaps be able to let go of some of those defenses and to, to find a place of, of greater vulnerability, of greater openness, of greater trust. And he breaks this down to three things that happen in us, starting with our, our attitude, really. And so this, is, this calls us to an examination of the heart. How do I look at people? Do I really look at someone as being good in and of themselves? Do I see their goodness? Not because they've done something good, not because they could be good or because they could be useful to me, but just because they're a human being. 
Do I see that goodness? Do I believe in that goodness? The goodness that God has placed in them, making them in His image and likeness. So just to believe, first of all, in that goodness. Apart from any good or worthwhile thing the person might do, the goodness of their being. And then to allow ourselves to be moved by that, to really see this is, as I said, an expression of God. This is a unique human being. This is somebody who will never exist again and has never existed before. Only this person is this person in front of me. To really reverence that and be moved by it, to allow it to move our hearts. This is amazing. This person is, is a, a beautiful creature of God. And then to find delight in that, without needing to change somebody. Sometimes we approach people and say, you know, if you would just fix this in your life, if you would just get over this problem, if you would just grow up, then you would be, even before that. Because in fact, our love helps some of those things to happen. Sometimes I think of it like a plant. You know, if you had a plant that's withering, yelling at it, or using toothpicks to kind of prop it up are not really helping the plant. What it needs is water. And the water has to disappear in a kind of mysterious way to reach the roots. And then the plant just sort of starts perking up on its own. And water for humans is love, affirmation, being with someone, delighting in them, seeing their goodness, allowing ourselves to be moved by that. And then the third, to display that in some way. It might just be through a, a facial expression, a smile, perhaps a word, an encouragement to express our being moved for someone in some way so that they can receive it, so that they can feel their own goodness. And in that way, what we end up doing is we give the gift of someone back to themselves. We receive the gift of them in our hearts we're moved by that gift, and then by our expressions, we give the gift of someone back to themselves. And there's a way that we can only receive the gift of ourselves from someone else. It's not something that we can do on our own. Related to what we were saying earlier about our it being in the image and likeness of God ultimately is in communion, in a communion of persons. We need other human beings. The goal is not for us to use human beings and get over them so that we can be with God alone. That's not the goal. The goal is to enter into deeper communion with human beings and at the same time to enter into deeper communion with God. And there's a synergy that happens there. The more we do one, the more we're able to do the other. But affirmation is a way that we receive that gift back from, or that we're able to give the gift of someone to themselves. And then uh, my last little model here that I found very useful, and I'll just cover that and then be quiet and let Father Tom talk. This is a little model of conversations, the kind of conversations that we can have. Again, it's the kind of thing that we've all experienced, but we haven't necessarily given a name to or thought about it at a deeper level, what might be good or how to do one thing or another. This is developed by a woman, Judith Glazer, using 20 years of research, and she did all of the kind of biological and neurological and studies and study people talking to each other, the kinds of conversations, what effects that has on our, on our brains and on our bodies, you know, what she could study scientifically. And looking, tracking the brain in particular, she identified three different <coughs> levels of conversation. The first level is a, a transactional conversation that we would see having a kind of ask and tell dynamic. So that's the kind of thing we do. I've already done it with uh, 30 of you here, probably. What's your name? Where are you from? How did you become a deacon? What do you think about your husband being a deacon? You know, just these kind of basic, uh, actually that last question is, those last two questions are even a little bit deeper, you know. Uh, the, the ask tell is a little bit more of a ranking serial number kinds of conversations. Where are you from? Where's your parish? How long have you been a deacon? Um, you know, these kinds of things, just very basic information. But we need that. These are important conversations. We can't just sort of dive into the deepest things when we're sitting at lunch together, you know. So 
There's a, there's a place for that kind of conversation. On the other hand, if we stay there, if we get stuck there, then that can become kind of stressful. The tell dynamic becomes a, a sort of tyranny or a dictating. You have to do this, and you have to do this, and you have to do this. The asking can become a kind of interrogation, and it can be very stressful to stay in that sort of first level of conversation. So we want to let that move us into deeper levels of trust and openness, vulnerability. The second level of conversation, positional conversation, has a kind of uh, advocate and inquire dynamic. I'm sharing a little bit more of myself in a positional conversation. I'm sharing my view on things. I'm sharing my opinion about things. Uh, you might say, well, what do you, what do you think about, dare I say, it, oh, what, do you, what do you think about the Amazon Synod? You know, now, now we're entering into a positional conversation. Well, I think a little bit of this. And what do you think? Oh, I think a little bit of this. I have my ideas, and you have your ideas, and we're gonna, now we're advocating and inquiring, we're jockeying for a position a little bit, we're you know, maybe debating a little bit, we're sharing our views. What do you, what do you think about this uh, Maronite church over here? What do, you, what do you think about this pastoral program over here? Uh, you know, so now I'm sharing a little bit more of myself, my ideas. It's also a little guarded. I, I'm not going to totally let down my walls. I, I'm trying to push toward a goal. So there's more trust, but there isn't total trust. That total trust opens up in the third level of conversation, transformational conversations, which have this dynamic of share and discover. And in that kind of conversation, I'm ready to hear whatever you want to tell me. Because I trust you. I trust that you're not trying to manipulate me, you're not trying to hurt me, you're just really trying to share from your heart. And I'm discovering, I'm not coming at you with my own ideas of what you ought to think, or my own ideas of who you are, I'm willing to discover from what you share about who you are and about your experience. I'm ready to receive that from you. And if I'm going to receive what's inside of you, that's the only way to do it. Because I have no way of knowing what's inside of you unless you share it with me. It's the only way that I can discover it. So spiritual direction is necessarily moving toward this third level of conversation, that share and discover. And that's why, as we said earlier, spiritual direction is not primarily about giving advice or about debating issues or about uh, doing different exegesis on scripture or something like that. Those are all wonderful conversations. But spiritual direction should have this dynamic of share and discover. That the spiritual director is open enough to receive whatever is being shared, that the directing trusts enough in order to open the heart and, and really share what's happening inside, what's happening in the relationship with God. The amazing thing that Judith Glazer discovered is that in this transformational conversation, we actually grow physiologically. It releases the chemical oxytocin, which is a, a hormone that really creates all kinds of good things happening in our bodies. And it actually has an epigenetic effect. And that means that it changes our DNA, literally. It changes the, I won't go into the biological details that I did check out about the ways that it changes the protein activations in our DNA. For all intents and purposes, it changes our DNA. So it, it actually affects us at a, a deep level in an ongoing way. So I found, for example, Somebody that I might disagree with on a particular point, although I'm tempted to convince them that I'm right and they're wrong, and I like to use the church weapons, you know, the church says, and these kinds of things. But sometimes I found if I let them share their position, I let them share how they came to that, I let them share how important that is to them, and I'm not agreeing with what they're saying necessarily, but I'm also not shutting them down. I'm really discovering what's happening inside of you. And in that process of sharing what's happening, something has a way of healing and changing, and slowly they start to grow or they start to change in their own view of things, and they start to open up, even without me convincing them otherwise. So just one example of how I've seen that kind of growth take place in an even more immediate way, resisting the level two conversation, 
allowing that level three conversation to unfold, some things grow and develop. Now we also need to push back into those level two and level one conversations because it is helpful to go forward, sometimes with a resolution, sometimes with a conclusion. We like to have a little bit of direction and spiritual direction, and there is a place for that. A lot of spiritual direction is this kind of listening, loving in an affirming way, receiving, understanding, and together listening to the Holy Spirit. And then the very end of spiritual direction often has a quality of identifying some things that have taken place, some things that we have heard, being able to identify what God is doing in someone's life, maybe coming to a conclusion, a resolution. Well, why don't you go ahead and start taking that time of prayer every day? Why don't you take this thing that we've discussed into your prayer before the Lord? Well, how about if you uh, then make that step and do the application for the diaconate? You know, we can come to these kinds of uh, conclusions and discernment. But a lot of times that happens by, first of all, getting all the way up to that level three transformational conversation and staying there for a while, really giving a space for someone to open their hearts, to share themselves, to receive that gift and to give that gift back to them. And then a lot of things have a way of falling out of that conclusions and ideas and problems, solutions for problems and these kinds of things. I'll just say one last word that all of this flows very naturally into prayer as well. You can really think of your conversation with God on these three levels as well. A lot of times that ask-tell dynamic, so we like to do both with God, both ask Him and tell Him. And those are beautiful prayers, petitionary prayers. We ask God for certain things. Sometimes we're in that positional place of trying to convince Him that our will is right. And He's very indulgent of that and uh, works with us a little bit. And sometimes as we work through our own ideas, there's some development there. But really we want to get to a, that place of share and discover, to realize that one of the reasons God is so silent is because He's listening so attentively to us. And he's really giving us a place of freedom, free of judgment and condemnation, where he is willing to receive us as we are. And if we're able to open our hearts to him and give everything to him, share ourselves with him, a lot of times just in that vulnerability, we find a lot of grace and healing, a lot of transforming love in God. anybody knew the things that I can't seem to get rid of, I can't seem to let go of, they would really despise me, and I must be the only one who carries around things like this. We would think that common sense, if nothing else, would remind us that everyone Some of you have, uh, in your ethnic background, and coming from Lebanon, Syria, uh, or having um, parents or grandparents or other family members know a lot about hurt and know a lot about suffering that affects generations and affects a whole people. And again, in our own individual lives, there are these dynamics too. So vulnerability means uh, on the, at 
first glance the place we are most ashamed of. But if we think of the wounds of Christ, uh, obviously the crucifixion of Jesus was the most shameful form of capital punishment that the Romans had refined and developed in order to serve as a deterrent to revolutions and rebellions in all of the political complexity going on throughout the world that many of your ancestors came from and that still exists in many forms in those places and in other places throughout the world. So the shame of the wounds that we have. And sometimes the other effect can happen that having been wounded deeply, we become forever angry and we become forever belligerent and we become forever entitled and we decide that we will never get over it. So that way of hiding in shame and maybe while still hiding behind anger to live my life out in those kinds of ways, avoiding getting in contact with what is really going on inside myself because I know it's too painful. Well, that's where vulnerability becomes a sanctuary. Rather than the ugliest place in me, or the ugliest place in the person who is talking to you in ministry, or a family member talking about a very shameful addiction, uh, some type of uh, way of life, some weak personal weakness, some personal inclination or orientation, all of these things that can be a source of great shame and a source of endless amounts of anger or endless amounts of uh, internal rage or disappointment. Those are the places that the Lord loves most in us, if we can put it that way, and that the Lord wants to bring healing into. And so sometimes our sense of a lack of the reality of God in our lives can come from the avoidance of those things. Now, as has been mentioned here over and over again, and as you know, the way to try to allow grace to work is to open those most vulnerable places. In a sense, to lead with one's vulnerability. Now that doesn't mean that I have to uh, go uh, into every relationship telling everything about myself and what seem to me to be all my dirty secrets. But it means that I allow what in me is very vulnerable to be open in the first place to the Lord, which allows us to have a transparency. You know, when we talk about transparency, we don't mean that we spill everything and tell everyone everything. That's the reason for a spiritual director or a confessor, that this is a person we can give the specifics to and we can really open the wound for it to be cleaned and for it to be treated with mercy and treated with love. You know, I think at the end of our lives, we are going to see many things that we haven't been able to see now. Uh, I once had a many near-death experience uh, uh, because of an allergy I have and went into anaphylactic shock. This actually uh, happened two times, but uh, several things I learned from that, and one of them is uh, the only thing I could think was how stupid it had been to worry so much and to be so anxious about everything in my life. Uh, 
one of my confreres has on his desk the words printed out on a huge card, none of this matters. And he took that from one of our other monks, Father Emery, who was in his younger years a rigorist and, uh, you know, sort of, he, he taught rubrics, to tell you a little bit about him. And uh, in his later years, he just became a jolly old soul. But anyway, suddenly he had a heart attack when he was, uh, you know, with some guests. He just had a heart attack, and his last words were, none of this matters. Not saying that what we do and our lives aren't important, but saying that the things we spend most of our energy worrying about uselessly don't really matter. And that was something that was very clear to me, and I try to recall that when I am anxious and worried. But the other thing that I kind of saw is that the whole way through our lives, we, we see ourselves going around, you know, like orphans, you know, trying to make our way through life, and trying to be understood, and trying to work through our problems, and trying to love, and try all these kinds of things. And the whole time we're going around like orphans, God is around us, and helping us and giving us grace that without which literally we could do nothing. And we feel he's absent when really we can't see him because as Saint Augustine said, he is closer to me than I am to myself. He is closer to me than I am to myself. Then my vulnerability becomes an opportunity rather than an occasion for shame. So these are the kinds of things that as we deepen our prayer life and have an opportunity to expand it further uh, through uh, certainly the reception of the sacraments, particularly the Eucharist, but also the sacrament of reconciliation and spiritual direction as an opportunity to open up these things. So do we have any time for questions? Okay. Thank you, Fathers. This has been very helpful. We have time for about two or three questions. Yes, speaking a lot. We're speaking a lot about transparency and revelation and bringing up so much that we have within us. Where do we draw the line, or where do we say, okay, it's time at this point that maybe you need to talk to a counselor or a psychotherapist? Because if it's going to be a time of tremendous revelation of hurts of the past, how do we know ourselves, either in us going or receiving someone, to get to that point? Yes, uh, that is a very good question and a very good idea. I think we should avail ourselves of all the types of help that we can. And it is important, of course, to have uh, some certitude that the, the, the type of therapy or the therapist with whom we might work is someone who is, at the very least, Respectful of our faith and of our state in life. I say that as a psychoanalyst, that not everyone will be respectful or helpful. Uh, if I'm dealing with my sexuality uh, and struggling with it, some therapists might say, just go out and get what you want, okay? And you want to be careful not to do that. But, you know, other than the fact that there are pitfalls out there, that is an excellent idea. But you know, your question uh, raises very, very quickly um, something to me, and that is we don't want to become so introspective. Uh, Paul Witz wrote a, an excellent book, Psychology as Religion. 
meaning that psychology has become the new religion. And guess who God is? Me. And the religion is endless introspection. That's not what we're talking about. And one of the most important things for us to do in prayer and in spiritual direction and in all the vulnerability is to know that a time comes when it's time to not simply keep going back through those, playing those tapes and, and picking those wounds open again, but a time to let go, to let go. And in prayer, the most important thing to do, to understand oneself, but to have the right relationship with God, is to turn away from myself. God. And uh, Bishop uh, Gregory mentioned the, uh, the image in Eastern spirituality, Maronite spirituality, of being before God as a mirror. Now a mirror can be a narcissistic trap where I'm constantly gazing at myself and picking open my wounds, or a mirror can be where I look to God. And I see myself in light of God. And there I will know myself with a greater truth than any therapist or any spiritual director can show me. So it's a balance of those things. Uh, and the Lord will show us in prayer when we do need further help, further digging, further analysis. But also simultaneously, how to let go of those hurts and how to let go of the past. Not that we obliterate it, but that we live with it and don't hang on to grudges or nostalgia or things that actually hold us back from God. Any questions? Yes. Uh, he is a psychotherapist, <laughs> by the way. Uh, I'm not, and so more in that position when I'm, when I'm seeing patterns, psychological patterns, when I'm, I'm seeing that there are things that I'm, I don't know what to do with, you know, I've helped to open it up and there's some trust there. I don't have any hesitation encouraging someone to also see a psychologist. I've had very positive experiences of giving spiritual direction to someone who's also seeing a psychologist. In some cases, also encouraging, you know, some people are hesitant about medications for different reasons. And, I've ended up learning a fair, you know, a bit of psychology secondhand that way. Okay? Well, what's your psychologist saying about that? You know, oh, that makes sense. Yeah, I get that. So anyway, I sort of learned some things that way. But I had a nice, uh, almost exclusively positive experience. Maybe there was one little thing here or there. But um, yeah, I think it can be a very positive combination when there are some psychological things people are struggling with getting over or working through. Also, add that to me, the, the essential question is freedom. So, to be free to God, to do God's will. Maybe there's some things that are really uh, encumbering us, and we're not yet, even in spiritual direction, not able to be really free to follow God free, generously. That's the right word, generously. So, there's like the the uh, spiritual director might say to you, you know, you're really struggling with this. It might be good for you to pay some attention to that. Come back a little bit more free, and we can continue with spiritual direction. Or you might even do both, depending on. But the issue is freedom. Freedom to do God's will. Questions, thoughts, Maurice?
Now, spiritual direction is obviously about directing our spiritual life. You have to have a spiritual life <laughs> as, as the matter, the fundamental matter for spiritual direction. So, certainly a committed life of prayer. Now, sometimes you need some spiritual direction to get into a life of prayer, and that can be a great bridge to do that. As I mentioned several times, learning to open these things up in spiritual direction, which has exactly what Father Tom was saying, not just introspection, but it's also expressing, it's bringing out in front of us to another person in spiritual direction, but it's teaching us how to bring out from the depths of us, all of us before God in prayer at the same time. So there's a real mutuality that should exist, but if, if we're just going to spiritual direction and we're not spending time in prayer, then it's, it's really undermining the whole, the whole process. So we really need to commit to that more steady prayer life. As I, as I mentioned several times, on, uh, certainly I can say for my seminarians, I'm not your bishop, I'll let him say whatever he wants to say for you, but for my seminarians, we have our policy in the seminary, you make a holy hour every day. And that's the stuff often that we're taking up in spiritual direction. Is the stuff that's coming out of that holy hour, coming out of that time of silence. Silence has a way of drawing things out of our hearts, drawing out the, the depths that need to be sort of looked at and processed and, and held before the Lord. So, yeah, so it's so essential that we have, uh, that all of us who are ministering in the church have a real prayer life. We're, uh, we're supposed to be the experts. We're supposed to be the teachers. So we need to be the ones also who are really dedicated to prayer and learning. The only way that you grow better in prayer, I, I love uh, quoting from Abbot John Chapman of Downside Abbey about a hundred years ago. He said, if you want to pray better, pray more. Just real simple. He said, if you're praying as much as you possibly can, make sure you're praying consistently. And what we can be sure of is if you pray less, it'll get worse. It's real straightforward, you know. We're often trying to jockey with God about, well, does it have to be this much or that much or the other thing? And pray as much as you can. We need that time in prayer. It helps us to grow. It helps us to develop our relationship with God. And then we don't know exactly how to do that. We run into different problems. We have some struggles. Good. Then bring that to spiritual direction. So, but I always ask, every, every time I have spiritual direction, I always ask, how's your prayer life? How's your, what's, what's the Lord saying to you? How's your prayer? And if it's not good, well, that gives us something to talk about. If, if, if the Lord is saying some things, that gives us some things to talk about. So, no matter what, it's always good, good for, for our spiritual direction. And for me, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that every deacon and sub-deacon is praying morning prayer and evening prayer in our tradition. If you don't have one of those uh, prayer books, you can get them very easily at St. Marion Publications, or you can get it on your little cell phone. And I'm also hoping that each of you would be praying a rosary each day. That, to me, has really saved me. Sometimes my mind is running in a hundred different ways, and the rosary grounds me, especially driving sleep at night or in the middle of the night, etc., etc. And, and I'm hoping that also you, you do have spiritual direction and to frequent confession. Those are all ways to strengthen your spiritual lives. And we, that's required. Another question. Yes, sir.
the transformational, uh, so the, the dynamics of share and discovery, and I was applying that, so first of all, in spiritual direction, and simply sharing with the other who is discovering from me. Now, in the context of friendship, where it's mutual, you might have that going in both ways. I share with you, and I'm very free to share anything, because I know that you receive me, and you accept me, and so I can share anything, so I can really share from the depths. And then there might be a mutuality that you're also able to share with me. That's the dynamic of friendship, that mutuality. Spiritual direction is going to be a one-way sharing and discovering, but the discovering is as important as the sharing. In applying that to God in prayer, you're right, there can be a mutuality there. In a certain way, I'm allowing God to share himself with me as well. That when I read sacred scripture, when I receive Jesus in the Eucharist, when I open myself to what the Lord wants to say to me, really allowing him to say anything, speak, Lord, your servant is listening, I want to have that openness before God that I trust him to share anything with and there's a mutuality. I want to open my heart to him that way as well. Share my entire self with him. That there's nothing I hold back or I feel is unworthy of him. I know that he receives me as I am. And so I'm free to bring everything that's going on in my life. Everything that's going on in my heart. Just to hold that before him. So that's, I'm not sure if I answered your question exactly. But maybe that clarifies a little bit. In a couple minutes, we're going to move on, but I've asked Father Tom and Father Nathaniel and Father Boniface if they would go back to their places as they were here, spiritual direction, but not to go to them for spiritual direction, but go to them.